today is the Sunday within the octave of Corpus Christi. That's Sunday after Pentecost. We'll be here again in Fort Hood, in Texas here. In the epistle for this second Sunday, the Sunday within the octave of Corpus Christi, is taken from St. Paul, St. John, first epistle of St. John, chapter 3. Dearly beloved, wonder not if the world hate you. We know that we have passed from death to life, because we love the brethren. He that loveth not abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him, in himself. In this we have known the charity of God, because he hath laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our life for the, our lives for the brethren. He that hath the substance of this world, and shall see his brother in need, and shall shut up his bowels with from him. How doth the charity of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word nor in tongue, but in deed and in truth. In the Gospel, the word of St. Luke, chapter 14. At that time, Jesus spoke to the Pharisees this parable. A certain man made a great supper and invited many. And he said to the servant at the hour uh, of the supper, to say to them that were invited, that they should come, for now all things are ready. And they began all at once to make excuse. The first said to him, I have bought a farm, and must needs go out and to see it. I pray thee, hold me excused. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to try them. I pray thee, hold me excused. Another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. Then the servant returning told these things to his, to his lord. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly in the, into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor and the feeble and the blind and the lame. And the servant said, Lord, it is done, and as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said to the servant, Go out into the highways and the hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. But I say unto you that none of these men they were invited, shall taste of my supper. Those are the words of today's Holy Gospel. Father, the most amen. Here's your considerations on this uh, Sunday within the Octave of Corpus Christi. One of the natural effects of the Blessed Sacrament, the effect of God the Father. The effect of God the Son, and the effect of God the Holy Ghost. These three are one. It's the same effect. What does it say? God the Father so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son. And what about the Son? The Son so loved us that he laid down his life for our sins. And the Holy Ghost is love that traveled out from the Father and the Son to the very ends of the earth. And he, he dwells inside of us by what we call the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. And so there's something about the love of God that is meant to go out. And if the love of God does not go out, it's not the love of God. And St. John says that how can a man love God whom he does not see if he does not love his neighbor whom he does see? It's very clearly made, made very clear in the sacred scripture, made clear here by the teaching of our Lord. Uh, there's something about the love of God that must go out. And if it does not go out, it is not of God. Now God has invited everyone to heaven. And we see here a few excuses, and today we'll consider one excuse that keeps souls away from heaven. And it will be the final one that we consider today. But there are some excuses that our Lord wanted men to come to heaven, to his heavenly wedding feast. And he prepared the supper. He opened the gates of heaven by dying on the cross. He established his church. He gave us his sacraments. He gave us all the means of grace. He gave us his, a, a new mother to replace Eve. He gave us all these wonderful things. And the supper indeed is ready. And now we go out to all those that are invited. And of course, the Jews were the first one invited, but then also the Gentiles are also invited. The Jews are invited in the Old Testament, and the Gentiles, as well as the Jews, invited in the New Testament. 
And so all are invited to the feast. A certain man made a great supper and invited many, and he sent his servant at the hour of the supper to say to them were invited. They should come, and all things are ready. And they began all at once to make excuse. The first said to him, I have bought a farm, and must needs go out and to see it. I pray thee, hold me excused. Another said, I bought five yoke of oxen, and must go to try them. I pray thee, hold me excused. So the one has possessions, the other has work that he has to do, and then there's the third one. Notice what the first one and the second one say, I bought a farm, hold me excused. And he explains, I have bought a farm. Well, what does the farm, so how does the farm stop you from going to the feast? I have to go out and see it. Hold me excused. The second one says, I, got five, I bought five yoke of oxen. I have to go and try them. I pray thee, hold me excused. But the third one said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. No need for an explanation. So the first one says, I have bought a farm. i got to go see it. The farm doesn't prevent him, but the need to watch over the farm prevents him. The second one says, I got five oxen. The five oxen don't hold him away from the feast, but he has to go and try them and make sure that they are doing their work and learn how to, how to carry a plow and so on. He has to go try them. But the third one, I have got a wife. And notice also, he doesn't say, hold me excused. He says, therefore, I cannot come. So these three things keep us away from God. Farm, but not the farm itself. The farm, because we have to go and see it. We're too attached to the farm. And the second is the oxen. Those who are involved in business, and their work holds them away, but the work is, is not a bad thing. But because they have to go and make sure that everything works, make sure their business is functioning, make sure everything's taken care of, they have to be responsible businessmen, this is why they are excused. But the third one, I have a wife. No further need of an explanation. Because what is a wife? A wife is an impediment to salvation. A wife says, you cannot come. And obviously, in the sacred gospel, it can only say one at a time. So the same thing can be said of husband. The girl goes out and says, well, you're invited to the feast. I've got a husband. Forget it. And the man says, I've got a wife. Forget it. Therefore, I cannot come. Now, this is a most grave warning to married couples. Remember, in the very beginning, God gave a command. And he said to Adam and Eve, go out and increase and multiply and people the earth. Well, what happened to Adam and Eve? They were tempted by Satan. And they were told, you will be like God's. You will have your own happiness inside of yourselves. You're going to have everything you do. You're going to have the knowledge of God. You're going to have the knowledge of good and evil. You're going to know more than you know now. You're going to be more fulfilled if you just disobey God. Don't worry about going and peopling the earth. Don't, go about, don't worry about looking to the outside of your family. But rather look into yourselves. You only need each other. And what did God himself say later on? Remember the same Satan, the same Satan that came to the Lord Jesus Christ and said that, that, the, that the, the three temptations, by which he, sacred, he quoted sacred scripture, he gave the three temptations again of our Lord Jesus Christ, and every time Satan quoted the scripture and quoted the scripture and quoted the scripture. Because didn't the scripture say that if you cast yourself off a cliff, the angels will bear you up? It says it right there in the Bible. It's in Psalm 90 that we read every Sunday night in the office of Compline. The devil quoted the sacred scripture and he told the told our Lord Jesus Christ, cast yourself off this mountaintop and the angels will carry you up because that's what it says in the Bible. But then the Lord said, it also says, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. There are two scriptures. If, if, if the enemy pushes you off a cliff, the angels will carry you up. But you don't jump off the cliff. And so the devil will say often to many Catholic couples, and he will say to many couples throughout the world, did not God say that you are two in one flesh? Didn't God say that you've got a responsibility to take care of your own personal salvation? Isn't that what matters? And therefore, what is the response when the angel comes and knocks on the door? 
And he says, you're invited to a feast. The response is, I have a wife. Therefore, I cannot come. How many souls are not going to the Latin Mass? Why? Because they have a wife. How many souls are not becoming Catholic because they do not have a wife? And what was the, 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 the advice of the most wicked prophet Balaam? Balaam, who prophesied the truth because the angel of God overpowered him, and he prophesied that Christ would be born in Bethlehem of Judah. He knew the very town, the very location. Over 1,000 years in advance, he knew the very place where Jesus Christ was going to be born. But did this make him change his wickedness? No, it didn't. So therefore he went to the king and he told him, I could not curse the Jews because their God is more powerful than my God. And when I tried to curse them, I failed. Don't worry that I, the prophet of the devil, failed. I have advice for you. You can conquer those Jews very easily. All you have to do is send your women into their camp. They will put down their swords. They will marry those women. And they will leave their God. And when they leave their God, you can send a couple of kids with baseball bats and wipe them out. You don't even need to send the whole army. For it is their God that protects them. And when they turn against their God, anyone can defeat them. But if they are faithful to their true God, their God, they can be defeated by no one. What was the advice of Balaam? Marriage. That was his advice. Get a wife and you will leave God. Get a husband, and you will leave God. Now notice the words, how the sacred scripture says this third warning. The wife is a sufficient excuse. And right now we are in a time of a test. How many marriages, including those that have large families, and are saying the rosary every day, and how many of these marriages is Christ present? And how many of these marriages is there God? And how many of these marriages is it going to happen? Because remember, before the 20th century, the most wicked husband and the most wicked wife never aborted their kids. That's a new thing. Before the 20th century, the most wicked, vain woman in the world had 15 kids. And the most wicked man in the world had 15 kids. Having many children did not stop them from being wicked. It is in our age, because we have learned how to both sin and, uh, with, with, uh, and yet not have children, that now we have wicked families without children. And therefore we consume that all families that have children are thereby good. Since if most wicked ones have no children, well, the good ones have children. And yet we see the wicked kings, the wicked pagan priests, the wicked, the wicked men of all ages had many children in the past, and they remained wicked. Now, what is the problem? How does Satan use marriage to destroy the faith? And how does may Satan use marriage to destroy the fulfillment of our responsibilities before God? It's quite simple. He uses marriage as a cloak for selfishness. The first man says, I have a farm. Yes, everybody has a farm. You need to come to the feast. No, no, I have to go and see it. Oh, I understand. You have to check out how things are going. Maybe you're going to rent it out. I understand. The second one says, I've got five yoke of oxen. Everybody's got a job. Everybody has something to make money. What's the problem? I have to go and try them. Oh, I understand. But the third one needs to give no explanation. He stands with righteousness and says, I have a wife. And I have responsibilities towards that wife, is included in that thought. I've got to take care of my wife. Now, what did our Lord Jesus Christ say? When the man leaves his home, he goes and cleaves to a woman, and the two shall become one flesh. On the one side, it's a very beautiful thing, because a man and wife become one. But there's a negative side to that. A man and wife become one. And what does that mean? Who loves his wife loves his own flesh. And that's what St. Paul tells the husband. Remember, your wife is your own flesh. Who loves his wife loves his own flesh. Who despises his wife despises his own flesh. 
And the same is true of the wife. If she is angry with her husband, she's angry with her own flesh. And if she's against her husband, she's against her own flesh. Don't be angry with your own flesh. Don't try to destroy your own flesh. But what does the devil do? There are some husbands that remain faithful to their wives. There are some wives that remain faithful to their husbands. Does this mean the devil cannot get in? No, the devil then uses the fidelity in order to damn their souls. So the devil comes in and he says, your responsibility is your wife. Forget about the saints. Forget about what Jesus Christ said in the gospel. Forget about what you sit in the pews with all your kids on Sunday and you hear about this, the parable today. You hear about all the parables of the gospel. You hear about the lives of the saints. You've got a book of the lives of the saints. And every single one of the lives of the saints was devoted to charity to the neighbor. Forget about all that. It shall not penetrate your mind. It shall not penetrate your heart. Just make everybody sit down and listen to all what the Padre has to say in the sermon. Make sure they say the nice little rosary. Make sure you take care of your duties and responsibilities towards your own family. And every decision you make must be for your little babies. And must be for your wife. And must be for your husband. And think not outside of yourself. You are learning to think like Satan. And what did Satan do? He told Eve, you have a better life. God said increase and multiply. Don't worry about that. God said, obey my commands, and I don't explain every detail of my commands. God said, don't eat of that tree in the middle of the, in the, middle of the garden. Isn't that good enough? Why did God say that? He gave you infused knowledge. He gave you, why did he leave, did he, you realize he gave you infused knowledge, but he left something out? He didn't infuse everything. He kept something back. He kept back the knowledge of good and evil. Therefore, God is not so good, not so perfect. You need to get that knowledge. You need to. You need that knowledge for yourself. You, when you have that knowledge, you're going to have a better idea of what to do and what not to do. This is the wisdom of Satan, which has filled our Catholic Church. It is the wisdom, for instance, in our modern Catholic priests. I've heard it many times with traditional priests. Many, many times. We don't care what our Holy Mother of the Church says. We have a wisdom of the modern world. You need to get out and experience sin. You need to get out and experience life. And then go to the seminary. And what does the sacred scripture say? No. Be saved from the contagion of the world and go right away. And that's what we tell young men. You want to become a priest? Go live in the world and commit sin first. And then become a priest. And what about the married? The married come to the priest and they say, Father, what should I do? You take care of your own self. You take care of your own family. That's your first responsibility. And then we read in the gospel what it says today. It does not penetrate our minds. It does not penetrate our hearts. It comes not in our out of our tongues. Therefore, we lead souls to eternal damnation. We don't read about what the sacred scripture says, about what the fathers of the church say, about what is the universal teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, are you not of greater value than the pagans? The pagans take care of their own little children. The pagans love their wives. The pagans love their husbands. The pagans love their homes. Our Lord Jesus Christ has a home. He's not in the homeless program. His home is in heaven. He lives with the Father and the Holy Ghost. And they have a perfectly happy home. And it's wonderful in that home. There's perfect unity in that home. There's perfect beauty in that home. There's perfect goodness in that home. It is the home that is called God. Does he need anything outside that home? Absolutely not. But what did he do? He left that home. And where did he go? He went into the world of men. The men that despised him. The men that were the sons and daughters of Adam and Eve. The men that decided they would reject him. He went into that world and there he was crucified by those men. Therefore, St. Paul gives a simple instruction. Do you really adore God? Or St. John, rather. Do you really adore God? Do you really do that? We read the gospel in the epistle today. In this we have known the charity of God, because he hath laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. For God laid down his life for us, we must lay down our lives for the brethren. Now consider those first 300 years of our church. There was no birth control in those days. 
And there were many famines. And when the Roman persecutor came in and found out that the wife was Catholic, they checked. Are the children also Catholic? Oh, yes, they are. Is husband also Catholic? Ah, yes, they are. And they killed the entire family. Every single one of them was sent to martyrdom. That's what they did. And did they follow the wisdom of even Jacob, the most wise Jacob? Jacob was on his way to meet Esau one day after many years. And he knew how Esau hated him, wanted to kill him. Therefore, Jacob took his 12 children. He divided them into two parts. And he took Leah and Rachel and put them in two different places. And he said, we will both separately, so that if when with Elias, if, 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 uh, if Esau meets the one family and kills all, the others will still be alive. So the wise Jacob separated his family, so that if one half would be killed, the other half would still remain alive. He divided up. He only had two children of Rachel, which is Joseph and Benjamin. So with Joseph in one group, Benjamin in the other. And they divided up the children of Leah, a half in one group, five in one group, and five, five in the other. So that there will be Leah's children would survive, at least one, at least some of them. One of Rachel's children would survive, and one of his wives would survive, and then he would die together. He laid it all out very wisely. This is the wisdom of the Old Testament. It is not the wisdom of the New. In the New Testament, we rather go to death. In the New Testament, we sacrifice ourselves. And this is a command. Now, what is that third excuse? I have a wife, and therefore I cannot come. The wife terrorizes the husband. The husband terrorizes the wife. The wife, instead of being a means to help a husband get to heaven, becomes a means to drag him down and tie him down and make his life into a living hell. And to make sure that he takes, you take care of your responsibilities, you take care of this, you take care of that. When a man was made to go out and convert the world, he was made to go out and wage war. He was made to go out and build the kingdom of Christ. And the wife was supposed to support him in that work. His secondary job was to take care of his children. His primary job was to take care of the church. His secondary job was to take care of the state. And his final and least job was to take care of his family. He's made for something bigger than himself. His first job is to adore God and to make his life dedicated to God. That's his first job. And the other things come after that. And the same is true of the wife. She is to have children that are going to sacrifice themselves rather than lose the grace of God, who are going to go out and do good to the neighbor. What do we find of all the women saints and all the men saints alike? Always receiving the poor. Always receiving those in need. Now, when we look at the first 300 years of our church, when we were under persecution, what did the persecutors of the church note? We're going to wipe out Christianity. We tried to wipe out the Hittites. They're gone. We tried to wipe out the Amorites. They're gone. The Greek original civilization is wiped out. All those cultures are wiped out and forgotten. But we try to wipe out these Christians. We try to wipe out these followers of Jesus Christ. These men that, that call themselves universal. They call themselves Catholics. They want the whole world to be Catholic. And yet we're trying to wipe them out in our city of Rome. We're trying to wipe them out in the entire Roman civilization. But they still say they want the whole world to be like unto them. These people are crazy. But see how they love one another. This is what they said. Look at how they love one another. These are not like us. How do they know that they were not like the pagans? What does it mean to see Jesus Christ in another? It means you see in that other that they love their neighbors. They do good to those that hate them. And this is a very grave obligation, and it's missing in us. And who is the first one to prevent us from loving the neighbor? The wife. The wife is the first one to stop a man from loving God. And the husband is the first one to stop a wife from loving God. And I'm talking here about the good husbands and good wives. Because there are the bad husbands that leave their wives and they've ripped apart their own flesh and have committed spiritual suicide. And the wife that has left her husband and therefore committed suicide, they are already dead. So these ones are already dead. They've already proven their selfishness to go to the greatest level of destruction. Because selfishness destroys. So in a culture of many years now, we have a Catholic culture in which we no longer believe in charity. 
We no longer believe in it. We believe in something else. And who is the greatest enemy of charity? The wife. The wife. The good wife. And the good husband. The greatest enemies of charity. And everyone understands. When you consider that parable of our Lord Jesus Christ, I bought a farm. Yeah, why can't you come? Oh, I have to see it. Oh, I understand now. I got five yoke of, five, five, uh, uh, yoke of oxen. Yeah. Aren't they in the barn and the fields eating? No, I have to try them. Oh, I understand. I got a wife. No need to explain any further. You got a wife? She's a headache. You got a wife? She has all kinds of demands. You got a wife? She's going to tie you down. You got a wife? She's going to make your life miserable. You got a husband? He's got all these insane rules. You got a husband? He is going to tie you down. The husband's going to tie the wife down. The wife's going to tie the husband down. The husband's going to make sure the wife cares only about him and whatever he likes. She's going to make sure he cares about her and only what she likes. And because they're good people, what's going to be their excuse? We've got to take care of our family. We've got to take care of our children. This is our first responsibility. And this is a trap. And the Lord Jesus Christ said many, many times, do not only take care of your own. What did Tobias, the great saint of our times, do? Tobias got up from the food of his table. He left his house to bury the dead. He took the dead bodies in the streets and he put them inside his house. So there was rotting bodies in his house throughout the day. And his wife had to step over the dead body. And the pan failing had to walk around the dead body. And then at night he went out and buried the bodies. And so many died without burial that he was totally exhausted. Every day he brought dead bodies into his house. Every night he spent the whole night burying those bodies. And one day in total exhaustion, he fell asleep under a wall. And a bird dropped dung in his eyes and he became blind. When he came home, his wife did not feel sorry for him. His wife said, that what you get for following your God. And his wife cursed him. She did not help him get to God. But he was able to overcome his wife. He was able to still do his duty despite his wife. And when she cursed him and mocked him, he wept before God. And his tears went up to heaven. And it went and it penetrated all the billions of angels to the throne of God himself, where the top seven angels are located. And one of them was Raphael. And God the Father sent Raphael, one of the main seven highest angels of the billions and billions of angels. He sent Raphael down. You go down and take care of Tobias. I'm not going to send a lower angel. I'm sending an angel that's closest to me. You're going to go down and take care of Tobias. And therefore, Tobias Jr. was brought to get his wife. Tobias Jr. Sr. was cured of his blindness. What held him back from God? His wife. And why was he so great? He was over to overcome his wife. Whenever when the invitation was made to Tobias, he did not say, I have a wife, therefore I cannot come. Despite his wife, he came. And we must understand that the way God made marriage is in order to people the earth. In order to fill the earth with soldiers of his kingdom, to make soldiers that are going to go out and carry Christ to the ends of the earth, to find a way to carry Christ to as many souls as possible. And in the time of tribulation, what do you have to do? Take care of those in need. Help those that are struggling. Love the brethren. And if we don't love the brethren, it is a proof that when we say we love God, we are liars. That's why St. John says, he who loves not his brother and says he loves God, is a liar. And in the Gospel the Epistle today, he says, who hated his brother and says he loves God, is a liar. St. John accused many of lying. He was a son of thunder. He was, a, he was a son of thunder who had a fiery temper. He turned to the love of God and became the apostle of charity, but his fiery temper still comes out from time to time, only in the interest of God. Let us not make a wife an excuse that keeps a man away from God, or a husband an excuse that keeps a man away from God. As we enter into the time of tribulations and difficulty, there must be the spirit of charity. Yes, the father must take care of the children and try to make them live in grace. But why? Why do you want your children to live in grace? Why do you want them to grow in intelligence? Why do you want them to learn how to work? Why do you want them to learn how to pray? Why do you want them to be good? So that when you die, your son will carry the faith to the next generation. 
he will carry justice to the next generation. The seven virtues, he will carry to the next generation. He will carry faith, hope, and charity, which will be the principles of his life. And everything he does shall be motivated by faith, hope, and charity. And he shall be prudent, and he shall be just, and he shall be temperate, and he shall practice great fortitude. And he is going to carry these seven virtues into the next generation and out into the world. Who blocks him from doing it? The wife, the husband. You've got to make sure that you get a job. You've got to get a college education. Why? Because you've got to be able to make money. You've got to be able to support your family. You've got to make sure you take care of the wife that you're going to marry. That you be good to the husband you're going to marry. That you'll be able to take care of your responsibilities. And all these modern women. I'll stay at home and have babies, but i got to have a career on the side in case my husband turns out to be a jerk. Or in case my husband turns out to die. My husband turns out to be a loser. He gets paralyzed. I've got to be ready to take care of myself and my kids. God will take care of yourself. God will take care of your children. Follow the way of your ancestors. There are women in the last 6,000 years that never had a career. And they had more tribulations than you'll ever have in your whole lifetime. And they dealt with more troubles. And for every single one of them, God carried them through. And they have produced saints. And they have been made able to make the world continue in Christ. Because they had Christ in their hearts. And they did not let their wifehood, they didn't let their motherhood, and the husbands didn't let their husbandhood and their fatherhood stop the kids from getting to heaven. What is it that makes it clear to the world that we are the followers of Christ? Do we love our neighbors? Do we try to spread the faith? Do we do good to those that hate us? Is anger inside of our blood? Is our primary consideration only ourselves and our families? Then the Christ is not with us. But if we pour ourselves out for the good of the neighbor and try to find a way to do good to those that hate us, then these are the signs that the true God is in us. And so let's make sure the true God does dwell in us and remains in us, whose we had marked him all the way until death. Remember, this is not possible without the great love of the Blessed Virgin Mary. What were her thoughts when her son was dying on the cross? At the very moment that we were killing her son, what did she do? She inspired a thief who was mocking and blaspheming God. Don't forget the freshness and the ears of the Blessed Virgin Mary. That when the crucifixion began, St. Dismas mocked and cursed and blasphemed Christ. Furthermore, her son was uh, the innocent and true and perfect God was being treated as a common criminal just like that man cursing right there on the right side of our Lord. But what did she do? She inspired him to, for, to repent. She gave him the strength and courage to be able to beg a request of her son. That's what she did when, she was, when he was dying on the cross. And how did she think of all that crowd that was laughing and mocking? And the crowd that didn't care, they had to go back and take a nap because it was taking too long, this crucifixion. And after all, they had to get out and get home for dinner. And what did you think of all these careless and cold and callous souls? She loved them at the cross. And when our Lord Jesus Christ said, Woman, behold thy son. Her eyes turned to all of us at the very moment that we are killing her son. And she poured her love into us. And that's why we're able to go to heaven. Imagine she only loved her husband, Joseph. And she only loved her divine son. Then there would be no hope for us. But because she poured her love outside of the Holy Family, there can be a holy church. And because she poured her love outside the Holy Family, there can be holy saints. And there can be a holy world filled with saints. And the kingdom of Christ can be spread until the end of times. And so let's ask her to teach us how to love God, and through the love of God and the sorrows of life, turn this love into the deep love of our neighbors that will bring about the victory of the Blessed Virgin Mary soon to come upon us, and the victory of Christ, and that we'll be with him in heaven for all eternity. Close God bless you all, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.